This is Jimmy Powers, ready to bring you another story from The Tumult and the Shouting. This is Jimmy Powers, transcribed, bringing you some of the never-to-be-forgotten anecdotes and stories from Grantland Rice's autobiography, The Tumult and the Shouting. Today we go to the first tee with one of the most colorful figures in sports golden age, or any age, Walter Hagen, the Haig, Sir Walter. Whatever the appellation, Hagen handled it with the debonair charm of a Jimmy Walker, another dazzling ornament of the golden twenties. Walter Hagen, through his golf and his color, amassed more than a million dollars and managed to blow about every cent of it. Now, the inference is not that uh, Hagen is broke. Far from it. It was simply that Hagen, like Ruth, Tilden, Dempsey, and so many other top headliners of the dazzling 20s, could uh, burn up his earnings as fast as they flowed in. So, with a bow to the spirit of Granny Rice, beloved dean of sports writers, I pick up the tumult and the shouting. Turn to the chapter of Walter Hagen and in first person tell you the story of The Incredible Man. It was in 1912, while I pounded out my column, The Sportlight, that Hagen, a young caddy then, was pounding the fairways of the country club of Rochester. In those days, golf was still pretty much restricted to the exclusive social centers around Westchester County and Long Island. Blessed with a pair of strong, quick hands, Hagen was trying to choose between golf and baseball as a career. Extraordinarily keen at shagging golf balls on the fly or on the bounce, young Walter caught the eye of Andy Christie, the club professional. Christie promoted the youngster to the pro shop, sweeping and cleaning up, but before long, Hagen's hands were busy wrapping, straightening, and mending hickory shafts and burnishing iron club heads. In 1912, the National Open was to be played at nearby Buffalo, and Hagen, then Christie's assistant, asked if he might enter. Not a chance, replied Christie. I don't mind giving you three days to go up there and watch and perhaps learn something, but I'm not letting any 20-year-old kid make a fool of himself in the fast open crowd. When Hagen returned from his short sabbatical, he told Christie, they're not the players I'd expected. Hagen's first open competition was in 1913 at the Country Club in Brookline, Massachusetts. Years later, we met an all-time amateur told me about Hagen's entrance. There was a crowd of us, including McDermott, the defender, in the locker room when this black-haired youngster came in and blithely announced, the name is Hagen. I've come down from Rochester to help you fellows stop Varden and Ray. We met did the stopping, but Hagen outscrambled and outscored every American pro except McDermott, whom he tied for fourth place. In 1914, I suggested I cover the Open at Midlothian, Chicago. The desk was unenthusiastic. Although some 350,000 people were playing golf in America at that time, probably less than 5,000 of them were around metropolitan New York. Hagen won that 1914 Open without any assistance from me. All told, Hagen won 11 national and international crowns, a record second only to Bobby Jones. He won the United States Open twice, the British Open four times, and the PGA five times. Archie Compton, the raw-boned Britisher, humiliated Hagen in a 72-hole exhibition match a week before the 1928 British Open. 
a stint before the Hollywood cameras, and the subsequent boat ride had rusted Hagen's game more than he had realized. While the British press chortled over Hagen's downfall, Walter retired to a secluded seaside course where he went to work in earnest. A week later, he won the Open at Sandwich. Comston finished third, three shots behind. The British changed slowly, if at all, but Hagen, by his tact, deportment, style, and overall color, did for the professional golfer what Babe Ruth did for the professional ball player. After winning a tournament, Hagen was often invited into the clubhouse, where he was the picture of debonair charm. The Hagen polish and unaffected ease was as real as it was apparent. But he was not the pushy type and never sought an invitation. With the then Prince of Wales tagging Walter's footsteps, somehow he didn't have to. During the Florida boom in 1926, Hagen defeated Bob Jones in a 72-hole challenge match, 36 holes at Sarasota and 36 at St. Petersburg. Bob's nerves were badly shaken by watching Hagen's ball disappear into the palmettos, only to hear a crash and see the ball come whistling out and land stiff to the pin. On one short hole, Hagen was 20 feet from the cup, and Jones, also strong, was nearly 60 feet beyond the pin. Jones holed his long putt for a two. Hagen turned to the gallery. What do you think of that, he smiled. Bob gets a half after all. Then Hagen sank his putt. Hagen was the first golfer to make a million dollars and the first to blow it. I was riding in a high-priced car with him in Los Angeles. He had a liveried chauffeur. You see this car, he asked. You see my driver? What about it, I replied. Just this. I haven't got a dime. Not even a dime. But I'll still get by. Had a golf glove been the Vogue when Hagen was at his peak, I doubt that he would have worn one. He never had a callus, a testimony to the basic correctness of his grip. He was also old-fashioned about shoes. Until the advent of knickers forced him into Oxford's, Hagen preferred high-laced shoes for the support they gave his ankles. I followed Walter in perhaps his bitterest match and certainly one of his greatest. It was at Pelham, New York in the final round of the PGA Championship in 1923 in a match play final with Gene Sarazen, the defending champion. Gene was then 21 years old and at the top of his game. He had just beaten Hagen in a challenge match. This particular match was dog eat dog all the way. In one spot, Sarazen asked for a ruling from the referee. Why don't you read the rules or can't you, snarled Hagen. Sarazen missed the putt and lost the hole. I'm glad I missed that, said Gene, so when I beat your brains out today, there'll be no alibi. Hagen had a 10-inch putt. He looked at Gene, expecting him to concede it. Hold it, said Gene. I'm giving you nothing but the works today. Well, that's the way it went. They finished the 36 holes all square. They have the 37th with two birdies. At the 38th, Hagen hit one of his greatest tee shots, a 290-yard hook that stopped hole high, 20 yards from the cup, with a shallow sand trap intervening. Sarazen hit a wild hook, and his ball crashed into a tree at the out-of-bounds mark. The ball was finally located in a wheat field, in bounds, but in wheat up to Gene's neck. I was standing next to Hagen when Sarazen played the almost impossible shot. From the wheat, the ball rocketed out and finally stopped 18 inches from the cup. I looked at Walter. He looked like a man who had just been bludgeoned. He then popped his short approach into the trap at his feet, and Sarazen won. But this I'll say for Hagen. He had won five PGA matches going into that final in the 1923 PGA. He then proceeded to win in 1924, 1925, 1926, and 1927. He went to the final round in 1928. That means that Hagen won 34 of 36 matches from the greatest golfers in the world, 29 of those matches in succession. Hagen was the match play king, and that goes for all time. He had no equal when it was man to man. Before World War II, during the Open at Canterbury, Cleveland, I gathered such golfers as Ben Hogan, Sam Snead, Byron Nelson, Jimmy Demerit, and others for a dinner. I wanted Hagen. Matter of fact, he was the star attraction. And I asked Freddie Cochran, the energetic manager of the PGA's circuit swing, to pick Walter up at a nearby club. The anecdote is Freddie's. I arrived and spotted Hagen in the bar, relates Cochran. 
Walter was wearing a handsome white sharkskin suit, silk shirt, purple tie, and the inevitable carnation in his buttonhole. He was immaculate. As we were leaving, Hagen decided he had to have one for the road. While we waited for our drink, some old grad spotted Walter and commenced to make a fuss over him. He had a tall rum drink with fruit in it. In his enthusiasm, he jostled Walter, spilling the drink and the fruit salad all over him. Hagen never batted an eye. Instead, he called to the bartender, See here, this fellow needs a drink. Mix him another, will you? The same Fred Corcoran also tells what is probably the most revealing anecdote about Hagen. It was in 1936, Corcoran's first year with the professionals as tournament manager. The tournament was the Los Angeles Open, and Freddy was half crazy trying to iron out all the last-minute details. He was walking down the first fairway when Hagen joined him. Walter knew that Cochran was worried. Freddy, he said, relax. Don't worry. Don't hurry. You're here on a short visit. Be sure to smell the flowers. That's the Hagen philosophy, and I'll give him credit. He's lived it now for more than 60 years, and when he gets around to putting down his life in words in a book, he's going to give a lot of readers a bushel of philosophical chuckles. Walter Hagen, a great competitor, a colorful golfer, a great fellow, and my friend. And now, this is Jimmy Powers transcribed and reminding you that next time, from the Grantland Rice story, I'll tell you how Granny rates his all-time pitchers. Until then, hasta la vista.